Good morning, everybody. You're listening to KUPS 90.1 FM Tacoma, The Sound. I'm Casey Kralchuk. I'm the host of the show today across campus. For those of you who haven't listened to the show before, this is primarily supposed to be a student forum. So I have a different club or a different set of students here in the studio each week, and we talk about, I guess, whatever they, they really choose. It's supposed to be a way for students to get their ideas and ideas and thoughts out on the air, and I am just here to facilitate. So here today in the studio, we have Be Glad, we have Cassie Marshall, Sam Mandry, and Michael Iyer, and it's going to be a great show. I'm really excited, so it's great to have you guys in the studio. Thank you. Yeah, it's good to be here. Yeah, so I'm just going to be introducing all of you like for this first segment, so if we want to start with Cassie, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, well, I'm a junior. Um, I'm originally from San Jose, California, so represent the Bay Area. Um, I'm also a KPS um, DJ. I have an hour on Mondays um, from one to three, or two hours. Um, and I'm a CSOF major with a studio art minor. And how did you get into comparative sociology? Um, when I was a freshman, I started taking classes for my core credit, like sociology of gender, um, sociology of family, cultural anthropology, and I kind of just fell into it because I loved all the classes so much. And is that something that led you to be glad, or which came, which came first? Was it the major or involvement in the club, do you think? Um, be glad definitely came first. Um, when I came on this campus, I wanted some way to, um, like, meet more queer students um, and also get involved in activism on campus. Um, and so I came to be glad and I just kept going um, more frequently and I just loved it. Um, and I think CSOC definitely um, is related mm -hmm. to my involvement in be glad um, and just my interest in overall um, diversity and human rights overall. So it's definitely connected. Well, and to give a we should probably give a brief overview of what Be Glad is. To Michael, would you want to just briefly explain, like, what what is Be Glad? Yeah, sure. So it's an acronym, and it's um, bisexuals, gays, lesbians, and allies for diversity. And allies for diversity. Um, and we we've considered changing the name before, and it's been in talks uh, now just to make it um, inclusive of a few more groups than it is right now. Mm -hmm. But uh, basically, yeah, it's an acronym, and. I think it's confusing for some people, but some people think it's like a group. It's a catchy name, though, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is catchy. It sounds cool. So, yeah, it's a queer straight alliance here at the University of Puget Sound. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, how, how long have you guys been involved with the club? Um, I started going my freshman year, um, and I was, it was kind of off and on. And then my sophomore year, um, I became, like, more involved going more regularly. And then... Um, I became secretary, I think, last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then um, this year I'm also secretary, so I'm an officer. Right, very cool. And Michael, you're a junior here. Yeah. Uh, how long have you been involved with the club? I've also been involved since I was a freshman. Um, I loved it. I remember I've changed majors, but I've like a lot of academic things have changed, but Be Glad has always been kind of the same. Like I always was going. I was going since I was a freshman. Um, this is the first year I'm an officer um, on community outreach, um, but uh, it's always been a part of my my Wednesdays. And right. what's your what's your major? I'm a psych major. You're a psych major. Yeah. Okay. I started out as a business major. I was in BLP, uh, just business leadership program, but it really wasn't a good fit. So Actually, I, I, start, I like, started out in business leadership really? too, and decided that business wasn't quite for me. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Similar story. Yeah. yeah. And. Sam, you're our third and definitely not the least guest of our group. <laughs> yep, that's right. Um, I am, my technical title is I'm Public Relations of Be Glad, so, because it's perfect that I'm on the radio with you this morning, I guess. Well, sweet too, Alec. Mm -hmm. Anything I can do to get your ideas and voices out in the air, mm -hmm. yeah. that's what a cross campus is for. And what, what's your major? Um, I am an art history major, originally from St. Louis, Missouri. And I guess I was um, on my leadership of my queer straight alliance in high school. Um, however, that's when I was just a gay straight alliance. And um, so going into college, I knew that I would um, be a part of the queer community on campus. And so it was just a natural fit for me to join be glad, and then, you know, I ran for leadership, and I was able to join leadership, and so here I am today. 
All right, sweet deal. I'm sorry, Michael, I didn't hear where you're from. Oh, I'm from Oakland, California. We're actually both from the Bay Area, but we did not know each other until college. So it's kind of funny. Because yeah. it brought us together. I was just... Uh, at the beginning of the semester, I was talking with the admissions... Or the admissions officers were giving a presentation to RAs just about the composition of this new freshman class. And a third of the new of the incoming freshman class is from California. And at least half of those have to be, like, right from the Bay Area. Yeah. And so you, yeah. there's, a, there's a big contingency here at the University of Puget Sound. And you're, I don't think you're the first... No, you're definitely not the first Bay Area students we've had in here. It's but, so yeah, funny. It's, great to ha- it's great to have Bay Area students in the studio. All right, so what do you guys typically do at a Be Glad meeting? Like, if you, if you show up, like, what's that going to look like? Well, um, we meet Wednesdays at 6 p.m. in the Student Diversity Center, which is right next door to Student Development and Kittridge Hall. That is across from the Diversions. And um, usually what we do is we have a short little icebreaker before we get everyone going, because sometimes it's a new group of people that show up at every meeting. But... Um, usually we will email us, email the body before and talk about usually a discussion or like an activity that we'll be doing that obviously has a queer focus. And a lot of times it's tied into something that's happened recently in the news or a queer issue that's seen on this campus or in the United States in general. So what did you guys do this last week? Uh, last week we actually made buttons for... Uh, this blood drive that we're sponsoring, which I think we're talking about in a few minutes, but um, we uh, there were some icebreakers, and we talked. Then we just made the buttons, and it was really informal. All right, cool. And what what about like you, you said that you usually like pick out a conversation or issue? Like, has there been any specific topic that was like a really hot one this week that got everybody going? Yes, and um, like Michael said, it's something that we'll definitely talk about later in the show, but um, what we talked about this week is how the current FDA on um, has a ban on blood donation for men who have sex with men, and it was a policy put in place um, during the AIDS crisis in the 1980s, and it is a very discriminatory policy that the FDA says it's not discriminatory and is, well, they believe that they are in the right. However, it is a huge um, rights issue that the LGBT community, it's not one that is very prevalent and people know about it a lot, but it is very harmful, and especially in this time where we have a blood shortage. Yeah. Well, so I think it's great that you guys are involved with the Queer Story Alliance here on campus. Uh, how do you guys see that working out in the future? Like, once you, once you graduate from Puget Sound, like, do you plan on staying involved um, with queer activism? I mean, definitely. I think, like, it's such a big part of my identity that I, I feel like being involved is sort of natural for me. Like, it's something that I want to do. And I feel like um, the fact that I have the opportunity to go to a school like this and get an education like this um, and be out and have that be an option... Um, is not true for so many people, and I think it's really important that I stay involved, um, especially for those people, um, to make the environment as a whole better. I think Puget Sound can be sort of a bubble, and um, it's a very accepting place here, but the world isn't, and so it's uh, really important to stay involved here. Yeah, I just got back from a Model United Nations conference down in UC Santa Barbara, Mm -hmm. at UC Santa Barbara, and I was on the Human Rights Council, and we were talking about sexual and gender identity and universal human rights that we can develop around uh, those topics. But when you have a room full of people representing all different countries from all sorts of the, all over the world, uh, it was really hard to like get any sort of consensus on anything. But because it's such like a t- it's a topic that I mean, depending on where you go in the world, everybody is I mean, completely divided. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, sorry, and I wanted to ex- extend that question to Cassie and Sam as well. Mm-hmm. How, um, do you guys see yourself staying involved with uh, queer activism? I definitely do. Um, sen- I wasn't really involved in that in high school, um, just because like, I wasn't out um, as bisexual in high school. And then senior year I came out, and our GSA was really small, and there wasn't a lot of involvement um, at my high school. So when I got to UPS and um, and went to Be Glad, like it really, it was the first love, I guess. <laughs> um, um, and I'm just really glad to be a part of it. And I think that it's something that I want to continue throughout my life, definitely. Yeah. 
And for me, too, I guess, um, one other thing is I'm also um, a member of leadership for um, Vox, which is Voices for Planned Parenthood, which is um, not necessarily the same. Uh, it's more towards um, sexual like health and awareness um, on campus and kind of that activism. However, it has a lot of intersections with Be Glad. And so for me, it's been really helpful to like be really involved in two organizations that I could definitely see myself working with in the future. And, you know, there's always after college and may or may not be heading up to Capitol Hill in Seattle, which is um, um, a big area where the gay community is in Seattle. So I probably see myself ended up there if all chances are. So. All right, sounds great, guys. Once again, you're listening to Across Campus. Uh, we have Be Glad here in the studio with us today. Stay tuned. We're going to be talking about the blood drive that we have going on today and tomorrow here on campus. So stay with us. You're listening to KUPS 90.1 FM, Tacoma, The Sound. Good morning, everybody. You're listening to Across Campus on KUPS 90.1 FM, Tacoma, The Sound. I'm Casey Kraljic. I'm the host of Across Campus, and today in the studio we have Be Glad, and representing that club we have Cassie, Sam, and Michael. So great to have you guys in the studio again. Good to be here. And in this next segment, we're going to be talking about a blood drive that Be Glad is sponsoring for today and tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And so, what what can you guys tell me about that? Uh, well, his, the history behind the blood drive. Uh, would be that uh, in the 80s, sort of along with AIDS hysteria and uh, the crisis that was happening in this country, uh, the FDA uh, made this legal ban um, where men who have sex with men cannot donate blood, ever. Uh, If they've had sex with a man after 1970, actually. Um, And the, the FDA did some studies and released some data from these studies uh, and the studies showed that uh, gay men or men who have sex with men had a hu- much higher percentage of uh, having HIV than okay. men who didn't, according to this study. But now, looking back at those studies, um, they were pretty flawed. I mean, at that time, there weren't, there weren't very good testing methods for HIV, and it was really hard um, to know, and so it was a major concern about uh, tainting the blood supply. And, um, but the, the studies that they used to, to look at to get those numbers were totally flawed. I mean, the sample sizes were incredibly small. And so when they talk about, like, they, they would always report the data in percentages and never numbers of people. And so that was because their sample sizes were, like, 50 people. I mean, they were really, 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 really small. Yeah. So if you say, like, 25% of gay men in the sample, you know, had HIV, well, maybe that's because there were four gay men in the sample. And one of them did. Yeah, there are a lot of things that happened with, like, the HIV frenzy. Like, I, I remember reading about how uh, Haitian men, like, weren't allowed to come to the United States or were denied, like, passports because, like, Haitian men were supposed to, like... They're, it's kind of, like, the same yeah. thing. Like, the, I mean, small small sample size and, like, just a specific group of people being picked out and said, like, exactly. Yo, you're the problem population. And then they make regulations like this around that. So. Yeah, exactly. And, like, now, I mean, all blood is, after being donated, is screened for HIV. So it's really, and, and testing is uh, really doable now and really accessible. And uh, any kind of blood donation service will test the blood. Anyway, so. And what's um, disheartening about this whole thing is that when the AIDS hysteria happened in the 80s, like, that's when it was called GRID, Gay-Related Immunodeficiency Disease, and it was seen as a disease only gay men get, whereas now there's so many other people that have, like, I mean, it's it's not just gay men that have it anymore, and it's, like, a global issue um, among a lot of countries, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. And so um, to try to say that it's this one group that is the problem in this is not true whatsoever and really has no basis. Because, I mean, any member of the population that's um, sexually active or, um, you know, has access to, like, being exposed to HIV, you know, like, has any similar, you know, ways of transmitting it through blood and stuff. So it really makes no sense that men who have sex and men are still being singled out by a governmental agency for, you know, an issue like this. And it's really sad. 
And so how did you guys bring this to campus? Like, you're, you're sponsoring the blood drive now. How did that first come up? Uh, well, one of our co-presidents, Jason Risen, um, is really passionate about this, uh, sort of as an issue. And it comes up for us as a club every time Cascade uh, Regional Blood Services has a blood drive. Uh, because for some of our members and for some of us officers, it's just definitely a hard thing because it's such an important cause. Like, donating blood is so important. But at the same time, we're denied access to that. And I think a lot there's such a lack of awareness that that's a policy. Um, cause yeah, I, I had I had no idea that that was a policy before. Like, I got there was an invitation on Facebook, and I... <laughs> That was the first time that I'd ever like realized, like, oh, I didn't realize that men who have sex with men can't mm -hmm. donate I mean, blood. I mean, it's kind of crazy. And it's it's a very discriminatory practice. There have been situations where, um, like, there was a man who tried to donate blood. I'm not sure what state, um, but he was not allowed to because he said he has never had sex with a man. However, he was perceived and looked too gay, in quote, so that he was denied donating blood for that reason. And it's a very discriminatory practice. And I think um, it's just because a lot of people don't know about it and there's not a lot of awareness that it's a discriminatory policy. Um, I think all, often it can be misunderstood, like, why um, a group of gay men or, like, a gay man might not be donating blood. Um, it might be misunderstood as, like, oh, I don't want to. Like, oh, I don't think it's important. And, like, people don't know that it's, like sort of against the law <laughs> to do that. Yeah. Um, I definitely know, like, previous to this, <clears throat> I've walked by uh, blood people tabling for a blood donation, and people have been like, oh, you should donate. And I'll always be like, oh, I can't. <laughs> and they'll be like, why? And then it starts launching into this discussion. But it's so interesting that um, the FDA would have a policy like this, but actually really never talk about it. Well, yeah, it's it's it sounds like one of those policies that was just born out of ignorance back when, like, there was just... Not there wasn't a great understanding of like HIV and transmission and exactly like how that disease works. So mm -hmm. it just it just seems like a very out of date policy. Mm -hmm. definitely. I think it's definitely left over from um, grid in those days where AIDS was seen as the gay disease specifically. Um, and I think definitely having this drive will bring this topic um, to most people's attention. Hopefully, just because. It isn't something that's talked about on a regular basis. When you, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Michael. No, I just was going to say we really want to make sure to emphasize that we're not protesting at all. Like, it's not a protest of blood donation because blood donation is so important. It's, it's rather a drive to get people to donate, but at the same time be aware that there's a, there's a huge segment of the population that's excluded. From being able to do that and so how do you advertise that like you get that information out and you say and you say that like look men who have sex with men are not allowed to donate blood um and so i like i thought i thought i saw that the focus was like donate for someone mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. can't donate while we're tabling um this monday and tuesday if you sign up um we encourage you to take a button that says um i donated for someone who can can't and for those of us that are um, willing to be open about their experiences, um, we also have a couple buttons that say, um, I am someone who cannot donate blood because, you know, I'm I guess, a man who has sex with men. And so people can um, come to the table and get one of those buttons and sort of show everyone else that they donated for someone who can't. So it's sort of a symbolic way of saying, I'm going to donate blood in the name of someone who can't. Now, how many buttons have, do you guys have ready to hand out? We have quite a few, so people should uh, definitely come by the table, and we'll, we'll be tabling all day today and tomorrow. All right, very cool. And do you guys see, is, has there been any movement on the policy that the, that the FDA has? Like, has there, Have there been any recent developments? Um, last year, it was brought forth again um, via a um, some Senate hearings, I'm, last I checked, um, with regards to this policy, and it was um, reenact, the policy was reenacted and continued because the FDA stressed on a few things that don't really make sense. One was they still used the old data from the 80s, 
and as well as um, some of their um, quote unquote reasonings behind this ban um, were more on their logistical errors and on the transmission of HIV in general that is seen in basically heterosexual or homosexual people in the queer community in general, not just the queer community. However, there have been um, lifts in similar bans around the world, such as in the UK, um, recently lifted the ban on, they had a lifetime ban on MSM donating blood as well. However, that has been lifted um, to quote unquote, active homosexuals can donate blood if, cannot donate blood, but if you if it's been a year or more since you have had sex, a man who had sex with a man, you can donate blood. It's still a very discriminatory policy seen in the UK, but it is a progress towards lifting that ban. Yeah, it's never like I've I tend to see that with most like governmental policies, discriminatory governmental policies. Like you never get how it's how it, how it should be or how it's supposed to be, but those those smaller steps are important. All right, you're listening to KUPS 90.1 FM, Tacoma, The Sound. I'm Casey Krolchik, the host of Across Campus. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Steven. Who said that? Me, down here. Ugh, what are you, a yellow booger? I'm a banana slug, Steven. What are you doing in my room? I'm your sense of adventure. It's been a long time since we've had an adventure in the forest. Mom took me to the forest last year. I'm a slug, Steven. It took me a long time to get here. You're right. I should get out. Yeah, the forest is not that far away. Hey, Mom, come to the forest where the more adventurous you lives. Check out discovertheforest.org for cool places nearby. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. The Sound. Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to KUPS 90.1 FM, Tacoma, The Sound. I'm Casey Krolchuk. I'm the host of the show, Across Campus. And today in the studio, we have Be Glad. And so we've had great conversations so far. I've enjoyed it quite a bit. And in this next segment, we're going to be talking about what it's like to be queer on campus. And so you guys said that it, that like, that what, like, being queer was a factor for you guys, uh, when you're looking at schools. So what was that process like? Um, for me, I came out my senior year of high school, like right when I was, um, like after I applied to schools, but I applied to like 13 or 14 schools, something ridiculous like that. Um, and so it was right when I was trying to narrow down my choices and that definitely came up for me. It was like, well, if I want to be out in college, like, I should definitely choose a school that is going to be accepting um, and have a place, like a safe place where I can go and talk about issues um, and meet people who are um, who are also in the queer community. So I looked, I did a little bit of research online um, and went to sites like The Advocate, for example, which is a gay news site. Um, and I think The Huffington Post also had some ratings, like, on, like, most queer friendly colleges so that definitely was a factor for me and did puget sound made that list um yeah when i um applied so i'm a junior now so this was like three years ago um it i believe the advocate um had like a top 20 most queer friendly universities um and i believe ups was in the top 20 i think it was number 20 but now it has since um, take, been taken out of that rating, unfortunately. For well, what well, I think I remember I talked with my resident director, and I think it's it's not anything that the university has like stopped doing. Like I don't think we've regressed, but I think part part of it was we don't have a specific building dedicated to queer studies, or just like a, a specific building. We have this we have the student uh, diversity center, and that's I mean that's where you guys meet, but we don't have a specific building dedicated to the LGBTQ community? Yeah, I think a lot of the reason why we have, like, been taken off that list is, um, well, most of the universities on that list are big universities who have lots of um, funding or more funding and, um, and more resources and more people just in general to have, like, gender neutral housing or a queer studies program. Um, and general neutral bathrooms and things like that. So I don't think it's that um, UPS has um, regressed really at all, but I think it's more that other universities have been doing more actively um, to ensure that queer students feel safe. Yeah. I would agree with that too. I mean, I saw that same rating from the advocate. 
and was like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. And it was definitely a fact. I mean, it wasn't the only deciding factor, but it was definitely important when looking at schools. But I think, like, what you were saying about the rating, like, it's just... Initially, Puget Sound was kind of ahead of its time with what it had done, which is how it made that rating. And then it sort of stopped progressing. It didn't go backwards anywhere, but it just sort of stopped progressing, and other schools kind of caught up and then kept going with it, which is why it's not on the list anymore. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that that's definitely on the list of, like, the improvements that the university wants to make, and, like, it's identi- that's, that's, like, a spot that it's identified that, like, we need to keep pushing forward with that because, like, like, we, like we've said, it hasn't regressed but it's not pushing forward at the rate that a lot of other schools are doing right now. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, and part of that, we have, as a group, um, talked with student development about the possibility of gender-neutral housing. And um, right now, they are doing some sort of kind of a pilot program type deal with um, last year, the, with the renovation of AL, there is a gender-neutral bathroom. Um, on the first floor of AL. However, it is um, key card access, and so you have to get um, access to the gender neutral bathroom. It is not for um, everyone's usage. And, um, and it's, just t- for, it's just for Anderson Langdon residents. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, so, and that's one of very few gender neutral bathrooms on campus. I think the number, like, I know some people who need a gender neutral bathroom on campus and the number is only there are only like four or five of them or something that are actually just designated gender neutral and so um student development has talked with us and said that they are working on it um on ways to continue it whether it be a separate applica- application process um for housing or having a gender neutral floor or one entire building being gender neutral but um we have worked with them and with the addition of this bathroom in al though it's a small step um it is a step in the right direction well and so I, i'd like to kind of draw out some of your experiences here on campus like what do you guys have any specific moments where it's like wow it's great to be queer here at the university of puget sound or there are other times that it's been more difficult um, for me, like, um, when I came here as a freshman, um, that was definitely, like, one of the most prominent things on my mind, like, um, like, like, trying, I remember the first week, like, kind of testing the waters and, like, coming up to some people, but not, um, but at the same time, like, I was still really unsure about how that was going to be received from my peers, um, and I think, like, probably halfway through, my freshman year, like, it just became apparent that more than half my friends were out, um, like, my close friends, at least, um, were bi or lesbian or, um, and felt comfortable sharing that, like, and I think that was definitely, like, a moment where it clicked, like, okay, I feel really safe here, um, for the most part. Yeah, and for me, it was, um, it was entirely coincidental that I came to a very gay-friendly campus. I, it wasn't really part of my application process too much. Um, however, I did grow up in a red state and I'm not out back home. And so um, for me, one of the things I promised myself is that I would come out in college and um, I was very um, ex- happy about what I experienced. I was pretty much opened with, with welcome arms and um, well, welcome with open arms, actually. But uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll we, we got, we got yeah. the idea. Um, but I mean, I will have to say, though, like the majority of my experience has been overwhelmingly positive. However, I think um, if you think about it and actually see all of the experiences, but um, I have faced some anti LGBT discrimination. Uh, it's been very few occasions, about one or two times, but it is there here on campus still, and it's something that we still need to work with. However, it is an overwhelming, overwhelmingly positive aspect of campus that it's, luckily, it's very few instances, but it is still there. But. Well, when you say that you encountered, encountered uh, anti-LGBT statements, like, was that somebody that you think was directly targeting you or was it or, or was it more like somebody just said like oh man that's so gay or that's um there have been times where um i've seen people say that's so gay and like for me as a gay man it's pretty hard to not take that personally um however there has been an occasion where like you know i have been called a faggot on this campus and it definitely 
you know, hit me hard. But um, being on this very positive opening campus for me, like, it's um, definitely, it wasn't something that I have a heavy heart with. It was um, something I was able to work through. That's great. And I feel like one of the <clears throat> amazing parts of BGLAT is that it has a very familial aspect to it. Um, and it's such a, a a sense of sort of looking out for each other for people in that group. Um, I definitely felt that when I was a freshman, and I definitely was apprehensive because um, I only came out senior year of high school also. Um, and I just remember going to the first couple of Be Glad meetings and like starting to meet people in it and meeting the officers a little bit and then noticing uh, how much it changed my experience when I was walking around because like I would always see someone from the group somewhere walking around on campus. It's a small campus. Um, but that feeling of being able to say like, oh, hi, oh, hey. And like that, that connection with such a wide range of campus because people who come to Be Glad sort of come from all over. Um, it was really, really, really amazing. And I think like when there's moments of discrimination and things that shouldn't be said and things like that, it's really, really cool to have a group like Be Glad to be able to come back to and say, look, this happened. Let's do something as a collective about it because we're all sort of in this together. Yeah, that actually sounds a lot like the Black Student Union, like black students here on campus who have like gotten involved with the club. For the, the, I mean, they've said that like, it seems like there are a lot more black students here on campus now, and it, it just seems like a much more friendly and inviting place Like when you have those support groups. So mm -hmm. I, mean, I, think that, I think that's a really interesting connection that I'm drawing between a lot of the support groups that you see in the Student, uh, student Diversity Center. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's uh, the thing about this university, too, that's kind of interesting is that it defies a lot of stereotypes that I had previously had about people in general. Um, I remember freshman year, my roommate uh, was an athlete from a very small town, and I was very, very apprehensive about that um, and nervous, and it was totally kind of a ridiculous stereotype on my part that I had. But it ended up being fine. I mean, he was great, and his friends were great, and we would hang out, and it was, like, such an eye-opening experience that I just... Like, I'm always talking about people not having stereotypes about me, but here I was doing the same thing with him. So. Yeah, it's interesting. I, uh, I'm in res life right now, and so I'm really involved with, like, the, those roommate interactions and then kind of like Cassie was saying, like, the, the, those first couple days, those first week, or the, oh, just like the first week or two, when you are kind of testing the waters, when you're getting to know your roommate, like, those are really critical moments. And so I think I just... I, that makes me feel. That makes me feel like my job is like all that much more important and all that much more like impactful. Because I mean, I, I've I've heard on a consistent basis like those first couple days and weeks are like the most important. Mm -hmm. And definitely trying to like, especially with queer students, um, there is kind of like a sense of having to like evaluate your identity, and that was definitely something for me. And um, on this campus, like you were saying, those first couple days, like our winks and everything was a very helpful period of me like trying to really understand who I was and come to terms with everything. All right, everybody, you're listening to KUPS 90.1 FM Tacoma, The Sound. I'm Casey Krolchek, the host of Across Campus, and today in the studio we have Be Glad. We're going to take a break, and we'll be back in just a couple minutes. Stay with us. Good morning, everybody. You're listening to KUPS 90.1 FM Tacoma, The Sound. I'm Casey Krolchek, and I'm the host of Across Campus, and today in the studio, we have Be Glad and our three wonderful guests, Cassie, Michael, and Sam. This is our last segment of the show, and I guess we're just going to be transitioning. Like, what, where, is, where do you guys see the club going, and I guess what, what do you guys have going on uh, in the future? Well, um, other than uh, the blood drive this week, um, I mean, we always um, meet Wednesdays at 6 p.m. in the SDC, open to anyone, um, whether um, queer or not, to come. But, I mean, we have a lot of exciting events this year. I mean, next semester is our big drag show, which is usually our biggest event of the year. And what we're really excited about this year is that we will actually be in the field house. Um, so coming up for that for March 23rd in the field house, it's going to be a lot of fun. Well, that'll be cool. Yeah, I uh, I was up in the dorm in, in my dorm room last year when I had a friend call me and say like, "Hey, are you gonna go to the are you going to go to the drag show?" And I was like, 
I have no idea. Like, and then they just said, "Oh, you you have to come down." And so I like came came down to came down to the sub, got in line, got a ticket, and sat down. And I I guess I was kind of ignorant as to what a drag show was, and I was expecting like some sort of a some sort of a race between like cars. <laughs> <laughs> and so and so yeah, when uh, men and women started to come out and onto stage, I, I was like caught off guard a little bit. It's like, what is going <laughs> What is going on in front of me? Mm-hmm. So, are, are, are any of you involved with the drag show, or do you do an act? Um, well, I was involved last year. I was actually the bouncer last year at um, <laughs> tickets, so I probably took your ticket. Um, but um, I know this year, I told myself I'm probably going to do a number or two, get those heels on. <laughs> well, so, what, like, I, I never, like, understood, like, how that, how that started, or, like, what, or, like, why... The queer community wants to put on a drag show. Um, well, in es- the essence behind drag is um, really is a sense of empowerment, and a lot of times uh, members of the queer community are subjugated to kind of this like secondary sex or third sex kind of um, place, and kind of gay men in particular are subjugated to the place that women are, and the sense that though they are women, and so drag is a way to be. Um, not only like dress up and have fun, but be empowered by it, and so um, that's why it's uh, very prevalent in the in the gay community today. And I think it's also um, we've talked about drag before as being sort of this acknowledgement of the performativity of gender, um, and how so many times gender stereotypes are so ridiculous, and everybody, no matter what your sexuality is, uh, can feel like they're having to perform to this gender stereotype. And so drag is a way of making light of that by demonstrating how ridiculous some of those stereotypes are because for a drag queen for example like a drag queen will be the um extreme extreme version of stereotypical (laughs) femininity as a way of showing how ridiculous those standards are kind of in a fun way um and an example of that you know like women um are like all the clothes they have kind of have these shoulder pads that are really necessary, but then, like, you see drag queens that have, like, three-foot-high shoulder pads that go past their head. <laughs> so it's just about, like, bringing out, like, gender stereotypes and norms that, like, are kind of created arbitrarily by the society that we live in. Mm-hmm. And, and and making light of them in a fun way, but at, and in an empowering way, like Sam was saying, but at the same time, um, it's something like, oh, this is so much fun, this is so empowering, I'm so proud, and then later thinking about, also... <laughs> This brings to light some interesting things about gender performance. Yeah, and I, I have to apologize from for my Minnesota accent in this segment. Drag show is something that'll make my accent pop out a little bit more than <laughs> other segments. So, but anyways, uh, so we have the we have the drag show, and then like when, when is that going to be? March twenty third, which is a Friday okay. in the Field House. March twenty third. All right, mm-hmm. mark that date down. It's going to be a big day. So I'll it's be sure. Tenth annual drag show, actually. So it's going to be pretty big. And this year we're having a um, focus on student groups as well. In the past, we've had um, drag troops from Tacoma and Seattle come, um, but this year we're hopefully going to focus on getting more student groups um, to be involved in other clubs as well. So we're really excited for it. <laughs> and all the proceeds from the tickets uh, benefit the uh, LGBT scholarship. And what, what is the LGBT scholarship? Uh, it's scholarship? a scholarship for an, an LGBT student who demonstrates leadership on campus. Okay. Um, and so, and for, is, it some, is it for somebody who's applying to be a Puget Sound student, or is it for current students? It's for current students, okay. actually. And um, it's a really, really great scholarship that I think a lot of people don't know about. Mm-hmm. But I'm trying to remember how much it is now. It, I want to say it's $3,300. Oh, wow. That's great. It's a yeah. lot. And it makes a difference, definitely. Yeah. Well, Michael, I know that you have class at 9 o'clock. I so I want to thank you for being on the show. It's been great to have you in here. And thank you. I've really, I've really enjoyed having everybody in the studio so far today. So mm-hmm. it's been a great show. So thank you. Good luck. Mm-hmm. Study hard. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Just a couple minutes left in our show now. And so I guess, I guess if... Where do you, I'm trying to think of like different things that we can do to wrap, wrap up the show, but like where do you guys see the uh, Be Glad going in the, in the next couple of years? Like, does the club have specific goals that they want to achieve or places that they see this, the club going to? 
Um, yeah, we do have some goals that we want to focus on. I think this year we um, we said that each year we should have a single goal to, goal to focus on. And um, I guess um, a lot of stuff we do is more outreach towards um, other areas of the community. I know we want to um, more outreach um, outside of the Diversity Center. Um, but another goal we're actually working on this year is um, doing a mentorship program with local Tacoma High School GSAs because um, I know from personal experience kind of uh, when you're in high school you know being a member of the queer community it is really hard and like not a lot of people know exactly what you're going through so a mentorship program is a way for us to like show our support to younger members of the queer community and like you know show them the ropes and yeah, I really like that idea yeah. of community outreach. Like, I, I, mm-hmm. had, I had a professor telling me that originally Ron Tom, the president of Puget Sound, had made it his goal to connect Puget Sound with the community a little bit more. Because, like, we, we mentioned earlier in the show that Puget Sound can kind of seem like a bubble at times. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a small campus, not that many students. And I think one of the challenges that the campus faces is connecting with the community. Absolutely. And, and I think that's really important. And there's also, you know, the stigma that, like, um, UPS students don't go past sixth and then, like, proctor on the other side yeah. of it as well. Yeah, and I think um, also a way for us to continue um, activism in our lives is to learn how to reach out to the community. Because, like, college, it's really easy to get involved because there's students everywhere and there's so many clubs. Um, but I think by um, by focusing on um, making a connection with the queer community outside of just our little UPS bubble that is so liberal and accepting most of the time um, and getting out there and reaching out to students who don't feel comfortable um, and who are young and might feel like lost um and so we're definitely working on starting that up right now um and it's a slow process especially like reaching out and beginning that process is difficult but we're really excited for the potential Mm -hmm. absolutely Um, and i know i guess another um goal that we have is um with regards to bringing a queer studies program on campus Right now, um, a majority of the um, queer-related classes on campus are in either the gender studies department or um, there is some human sexuality that is covered in the psych department. Um, however, And right now, the only um, class that's um, relevant to the gay community, like first and foremost, is a gay and lesbian literature class. And it's been a couple years since that has been previously offered. So um, the importance of having other classes, whether they be like queer theory or trans theory or um, history of the gay community or just like a class on Stonewall or something is necessary like the same way like it's necessary for us to have our AFAM studies department and our gender studies department yeah and so are you guys in contact with school administration and trying to promote that program or in trying to find professors we have been in the past and we're hoping to continue that in the future mm-hmm. all right great uh were there any last comments that you guys wanted to get in before we wrap up the show um, I don't think so. I think we covered a pretty good mm-hmm. um, canvas of what DGLAD is about and what we want to get involved in more. Mm-hmm. Um, and definitely, if anyone is interested um, in supporting the queer community or just um, learn, getting to know us a little bit better, you should definitely come down to the SDC on Wednesdays at 6. That's when we meet. All right, great. It's been a phenomenal show, show so far, really. Well, I guess we're at the end of it now, but it's been a great show. I'm glad that you guys came in. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you very much. All right, everybody, you're listening to Across Campus. I'm your host, Casey Krolchek, and you're listening to KUPS 90.1 FM, Tacoma, The Sound.